Welcome to the new episode of All That Jazz. I'm your host, Matyash, and I have with me a very special guest today, Peter Tickton. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. So um, the the reason I wanted to br- bring in uh, Peter is because he knew Donald Trump uh, way back when uh, he went to New York uh, Military Academy. I believe when you guys were teenagers, like 16, 17, is that correct? Yeah, we really got to know each other when I was when we were both 16. And yeah. uh, but the year that we were 17 uh, was much more. Uh, we were much more together because that year he was my captain. He made me his first platoon sergeant. So he basically had me running company A for him. Uh, I, I joke and tell people I ran his first company for him, but right. that was the military company in the military academy. Um, I watched your speech just before we did this and you said something very interesting that I think is very true because um, when you live with somebody, you really get to know them. And uh, I've lived that kind of nomadic life for a few years. I lived in hostels and you really kind of get to know people when you live in close quarters, you know? And uh, so I, I, if I'm not mistaken, you live one uh, school year with, uh, in the same room with Donald Trump? Well, not the same room, but the okay. room's very close. But, uh, you know, he was on the first floor and I was on the second floor just above the stairs. And, and so, uh, but we worked together, you know, he was the captain of the company and he, you know, this, this isn't a school like a normal school. It's, it, it, in ways, it's, it's much better than most schools in that the academics are, are better. There's only, at our largest class had 12 students. So, and we, and we had incredible teachers. We, you know, wonderful teachers. I still remember so many things from high school that I learned in high school that most people just have forgotten because right. they didn't really learn it. And the, uh, so the academics were great. The military training was, was excellent as well. We were an accredited ROTC school uh, subject to government inspections and so on each year. And, uh, but we're there 24 hours a day. So in a way it was like reform school. You know, we got to go home for Thanksgiving for five days, Christmas for 10 days and Easter for seven days. And that's what we called it then, Christmas and Easter, uh, not uh, winter break and spring break, because that's what they were around. That was the time, you know, that people were going home to celebrate those holidays. So, uh, but other than that, we were there. I mean, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It wasn't uh, as though I wanted, you know, I think I'll just go to some restaurant in the nearby town and have dinner with some friends. It, that was not an option. That would have been what they call AWOL, absent without official leave. Right. And you could get uh, expelled. You know, it was not something that anybody did. Right. So this was so, basically preparation for if you wanted to go in the military or the Marines or the Army. Or, or the college of your choice. Okay. Uh, we had a pretty good acceptance rate for the college of our choice. I actually got into Columbia University from, from there and that that was one of the reasons I went there because the, the high school, the public school that I was would have gone to in Mount Vernon, New York, nobody got into Columbia. And that was my father's alma mater. So he really wanted somebody to go. My other three brothers didn't make it in. So it was up to me. I made it in and then I decided to go someplace else anyway. Uh, so it, it right. was so one it of my older out. brothers. So what it, do you do now? Out. What do you do now? Oh, I'm a trial lawyer. Uh, that's what I do. I... Uh, uh, do a lot of business litigation, some divorce, some, uh, some a little bit of PI, but that's not really my main bailiwick. It's mainly uh, business litigation, which really involves a lot. Uh, it's not just one partner suing another, but it's so many different scenarios, uh, and it's it's more of an interesting situation. Mm. Uh, Given that you are a lawyer, what's your opinion on that? Um... I think his last name was Cohen, the, not the first, not the Roy Cohen, but the one later on that, uh, that recorded uh, Trump's uh, Michael uh, interactions. Cohen. Yeah. I like, think he's a scumbag that's in jail that belongs in jail. Uh, I hope he's still in jail. You, you know, I mean, what, a, you know, I mean, the guy walks around saying he'll take a bullet for, for, for Donald Trump. And, you know, the fact is a lot of us feel that way. And, 
for, but we can't say that because it was said by Michael Cohen in such an un, insincere way that, you know, it, it, anyway, the fact of the matter is the guy, the, no matter how you look at it, I'm sure he's disbarred by now. I mean, he's guilty of a felony and nobody can right. remain a lawyer once they have that kind of a conviction. Uh, at least in most states, that the states I know, he he's just a bad dude, bad right. character, bad guy. You know? What's your opinion of the other? Because uh, I've, I've um, read a few of um, Trump's books, and there's a bare mention of uh, a guy he met. I think in Art of the Deal, he mentioned Roy Cohn, and uh, apparently Roy Cohn was some kind of an influence on Trump's the way he. Um, he fought back, like not that that yeah. wasn't uh, Trump's personality anyway. I, I know you're talking about a, right. a, a blonde, long-haired, uh, tall, thin guy. I, I, I know, I know who you're talking about. Not, not a handsome fellow though. No, uh, <laughs> no, no. I, uh, but yet very influential. That guy knew everybody in New York City apparently, and uh, helped uh, Donald move move up in the ranks in terms of uh, you know whose associations were with. So, but I really don't know much about him. I really knew Donald well. I was probably the closest one in our class to Donald in our senior year. I hope you don't mind me calling him Donald. I'm trying to be pretentious. That's just how I know him. And that's yes. how it comes out. So uh, a lot of people just know Donald by, I'll call him Donald as well. No, I, that's, good. <laughs> that's what he wants to be called, by the okay. way. Okay, you know? okay. Um, uh, when they see clips on TV, especially, um, people that just watch CNN or stuff like that, they have an incredibly skewed opinion of Trump because they, what they see on TV is just uh, um, skewed in a negative way, especially when he was president, even now. Um, so um, what was your opinion, let's say, when you first met Donald Trump? Well, you know, when you first meet, when we first met probably in one of our classes, but it's not like you can talk in class. Uh, not in those small classes. You're paying attention to what your your, your teacher is doing. Uh, we were in a much more brutal type of environment as well. Um, I remember my English teacher. The first day he gave everybody uh, an assignment, and the second day he went around the room. There were four students in a row, and another four students, and another four students. And you know those kinds of desks that have those arms that you know. It's like an armchair. One side's got that arm, and then it turns into a little desk in front of you. Yeah. And the, this teacher, he was also the, the coach for the wrestling team. His name was Brochure. And uh, while he was picking up papers from the guy in the back, the two guys to my left talked to each other, uh, whatever comments they made. And uh, this teacher came around to the front of the room. And he said, there'll be no talking in my class when I'm going around the room and my back is turned on you and you dare to talk. And he smacked the guy next to me across the face and gave the other guy a backhand and he and his desk went flying across the rest of the room. Uh, nobody talked in that class again, I can promise you. It was just a different kind of world that we were in. So, wow. Uh, it, yeah, so it wasn't like, hi, my name is Peter, your name is Donald. It wasn't like that. I, 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 we really got to talk uh, more than anything, when we were on the soccer team in our in my first year, it was his fourth year. I'm sorry, it was my the beginning of my second year. That would have been his fourth year. Right. And um, and uh, you know, I'll tell you, it was really interesting. I mean, most of the players, almost all the players, were uh, from Latin America. And soccer players. The soccer players, yeah. yeah, they didn't go for football so much as for uh, <laughs> right. what they they would call at home football, what what we call soccer, and uh, what good guys they were. Everybody got along on this team. It didn't matter where you were from. Nobody ever gave any consideration to that kind of stuff. And uh, but he and I were, you know, both from New York, so it made sense that we would uh, sit in close proximity on a bus and 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 talk about certain things and and so on so that's where I got to know him a little bit I uh, explained uh, a situation where I really got to know him on one of those trips because uh, I had gotten into a, a jam with uh, something I was really innocent about but I explained it all in my book uh, you know uh, what makes Trump tick and yeah uh, I was kind of shunned a little bit uh, until people realized it was all nonsense 
and but he was the one that broke it. He was the one that didn't care and was happy to talk. I mean, it wasn't like an official shun, don't talk to Peter, but people thought I had done something that was unseemly, which I hadn't done. And uh, it would take too long to explain it. It's not worth right, right. Uh, it's, it's all right. Yeah, it's kind of interesting in a way, but you got to, you know, it's in yeah, the book. It, it was uh, it was something of the time and, and something that happens in uh, gossip and people think you did something, but you didn't do it. And then it's still still people believe it. So it's yeah, one of those things. Yeah, right. It was kind of yeah, it involved making fun of a kid's father who had died. And it was somebody had another person had done that. And, blamed it on me but in any right. event uh so that was something that was kind of unacceptable by most of the cadets but donald knew me already and he knew that wouldn't be something i would ever do right and so uh, on the bus uh you know all of a sudden we're talking and nobody else felt the need to not talk to me so it kind of broke that 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 nasty spell uh there are a lot of people that have a lot of thank thanks to donald for in, in that school. Uh, there was another cadet, his name was Theodore Pate, and he became a doctor eventually. And he was a, a little guy, you know, from uh, Peru. And in his company, which was also Donald's company, John, that was before Donald was a captain, he was a supply sergeant. And he saw this guy getting hazed and he knew that it just, it was not going to be a thing that's going to end well. So he took it upon himself to go to the commandant's office and said, you look, you've got to move this guy. He's got to be moved to a, a different mm. company. Where... So he went down to where the, where the cadets were a little bit younger and therefore a little smaller. And, uh, and I talked to Dr. Pate since then. Uh, I'm sorry to say he, he passed away about two months ago, but, uh, one of the things he told me is that Donald Trump saved his life. His, his, his entire life is better because of the, uh, of what Donald did in terms of getting involved and taking it upon mm -hmm. himself. So there was a, a lot of kindness that people miss about, they see the bombastic personality and, and I'm um, maybe it's a bit of a persona when he's on the stage and all that, that's, he's a bit of a showman, but, uh, when when Donald is one on one, there, there's um, there's a kindness and there's a consideration for the people, and that's why he ran for president. Like he he lost yeah. a tremendous amount of money, a tremendous amount of money, like billions of dollars, and he could have built buildings and could have could have done a lot of things, but he chose not to, and he chose to um, to give back to America that gave him so much. Worse than that, he he's put himself in jeopardy. I mean, right now they're looking to impeach him for the second time but that's nothing i mean there are other people that are talking about having him prosecuted for what for murder by depraved indifference for inciting a riot uh and where people died uh this the uh the craziness out there the hatred for this man and over nothing i mean you know i realize that i look at him differently than most people because i know him uh i'm a father of grown children uh, I look at my children and, and most people who are parents of grown children look at their children the same way and they always see them. They see them as the adults that they are. And at the same time, they see them as the child that they were. And it changes the way you see that person. Yeah. And so I see Donald as that good guy that I lived with when we were 17, who was idealistic and, uh, and I, I and I have to say brave, and that's part of what the book is about. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, let me hold it up so that anybody can see what it is. It's it's yes. uh, what makes Trump tick. It, it may be at an airport near you. It's in Hudson bookstores there, uh, but you can order it on Amazon. And I recommend it. Please read it. If you don't laugh out loud at least once, uh, I'll buy it back from you. Okay. <laughs> uh, it, it, there we go. It's a it's a good read. I I wrote it myself. It's not from you know, some kind of a uh, ghost writer. Right. And uh, it tells a story. The, uh, but what we're talking about is a guy who is just fundamentally a good person. You know, he lives for a purpose. It's right. not like living from day to day with no direction. This is a man who knows how to make goals. 
And, yeah, and, uh, and after it. he went to Wharton, just after after he finished military, did he straight at the New York Military Academy? Did he go straight to Wharton out of that? No, no, no. And that's why Mary Trump's book didn't make any sense. No, he went to Fordham uh, College at first, and, and okay, I think that's in the Bronx. And then he went to uh, Warden after that, which is uh, Ivy League school, at, you know, the University of Pennsylvania. You, so, you mentioned Mary Trump. Uh, I didn't uh, read what she wrote. Oh. But I know she, she was on MS, MSNBC and CNN and all these. Uh, right. She made millions of dollars by lying about her uncle. You know, this is a real character. Uh, mm. Good person that I, I, I'm being sarcastic. You know, yeah, Frank, yeah, frankly, yeah. she she was saying that he uh, had somebody take the SATs for him uh, at that and, and that uh, it was to get into Wharton. And in fact, the SATs were not for graduate schools. They were for colleges. That's why I said it doesn't make sense. But I know for a fact that, that she was lying because nobody took the exam for him. And how do I know I was there? You know, and there are only a hundred of us. <laughs> So uh, what's what makes these people lie so much? It's just the money that, you know, because she knows Trump, like she's a relative, obviously. And she's like, oh, I'm going to make a buck because I don't like his politics and I'm just going to make stuff stuff up. Is that it? Like, well, you know how they talk of tribalism, you know, and it's it's, yeah. it's partially being part of the tribe, being able to be an important person in the Democratic ranks, uh, being as well as the, the 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 fame and the money. I mean, you know, three things that are irresistible: a sense of belonging, coupled with uh, riches, coupled with uh, with uh, whatever else goes along with that kind of success in, right. in society. So you know, so you know that that's how they get sucked into it. But these people live in a, a world of lies. You know they lose they lose sight of who they are or what the world is because that's what happens to uh, to to people that live in in lies they they uh, they don't know the difference between reality anymore they don't know who they are they don't know what's what they just kind of like one step ahead of the other they become a form of an automaton right what was uh was trump uh uh political or did he uh, have any uh, strong positions in classes let's say early on but, when you met him well i mean un understand that we come from a different age yeah you know you you come from a different place in the world altogether right uh, we come from a different time in the world altogether donald and i were both born within the first year uh following world war ii and at the time we were young children, they still had air raid sirens going in New York City and everywhere in the US. Mm -hmm. They still had uh, exercises where the sirens would go off and everyone in the car, any car anywhere had to pull over and stop. Children had to get under the dashboard or down on the floor in the back. Uh, no eye is looking up because when the glass shatters, it, you don't want them going into your eyes. Uh, in school, we would get under our desks, pointed away from the windows so that, again, so the glass wouldn't penetrate through our eyelids. These are the things we're taught as young children and the exercises we had. It was a serious world. It was a world where parents didn't have time for n uh, childish nonsense. Uh, children were expected to be seen but not heard, is the right. expression. Uh, there was another expression which was uh, spare the rod is to spoil the child <laughs> and well it, it's the way it was uh, there were very few children i knew that weren't afraid of their fathers or mothers uh sometimes the mothers sometimes the mothers were the loving one and the father was the the, the disciplinarian that was tended to be the standard uh, but it was a different world and uh it, it, whipping your son to you know to a point where you know they they they're bedridden afterward is was not something that was considered a problem, it would sometimes be a problem or considered a problem if you didn't. So it was, now they put a person in jail for just a small amount of what was going on in those days. Right. And then we went to New York Military Academy where brutality was what was in order as well from our older cadets, as, uh, as I was mentioning. Uh, now, when 
Donald came to New York Military Academy, I understand he was a real wiseacre, a real wise guy. Uh, he uh, he thought very well of himself, and you know, there were a lot of rich kids there. It wasn't I, I wasn't one of the rich ones, but in fact, that's why I went to a military academy. That was my main reason. I figured, unlike the other schools where people are wearing expensive clothing and know all the the how to how to dress, how to how to do everything they knew how to do, I thought at least in a military academy, the threads would be a little more, mm -hmm. you know, the uniforms were uniform uh, and uh, didn't indicate uh, where you came from or what you were worth. And frankly, nobody ever gave a damn in my, my academy as to family ties or anything along those lines. It was all, uh, you know, who you were and how you measured up in terms of what you were accomplishing, whether it was academics or sports or military performance. How was uh, Donald in, in uh, the academics? In athletics? Yeah, yeah, athletics and the, the, the uh, how was he doing in school in general? Oh, in academics? Yeah. Uh, okay, I didn't quite hear the question. Okay. Uh, the, uh, it, when you see a picture of Donald Trump uh, in his uniform, you'll notice that there's a star on the sides of his collar on each side. Right. Uh, if you, were, uh, I think it was a B student, you would have, uh, or maybe it was B, B plus, you would have bronze stars. Uh, a minus, you would have silver and A or A plus. I don't remember exactly how it was structured. You'd have gold stars. He, he had gold stars. So he, at least in one semester, uh, was able to achieve that. Uh, mm -hmm. He was, he and I competed for marks to, uh, and uh, we didn't end up in the top 10 of our class, but we were both extremely close to it. You know, we were probably 11 and 12. Um, and for a long time, you know, like the end of our first trimester, let's just say, you know, yeah, we would easily have been in the top 10. But, you know, I guess in our senior year, we, we, we uh, slacked off right uh, after that. Because they're already and, in college and what the heck. Right. As I understand, yeah. there was also no, this was at the time, it was all boys, no girls. All boys, no girls. And that's the funny thing, because at the end of the year, uh, there were some things that were done spontaneously. And I was involved in that. I was, I was a member of the Ramble, which is like the newspaper that we put out uh, in our class. But understand, we only had hundred guys in our class. One guy got expelled the morning of graduation. So we ended up with 99. Well, they wanted to get that guy because he had done some things wrong. And just and on the last day, they got him. The last guy, they, at my table, he's, he's at my table and somebody at the other end of the table said, hey, can you throw me a glass? And so he tossed the guy a glass and throwing a glass in the mess hall was caused to be expelled. Wow. So they expelled them on the spot. They told them to be out of it, get packed, get, and you have to be out off the grounds by 11 because graduation was whatever time. Uh, that was a, um, yeah, that was a fellow name. His last name was Wax. I still remember. Uh, anyway, he, he had hypnotized somebody earlier that year. He hypnotized uh, somebody? Yeah, yeah. He hypnotized somebody in the barracks. Oh, my gosh. band. And he hypnotized one of his band members and that told him, oh, there's a beautiful woman and, you know, she's undressing or whatever. I don't know what he told her exactly. I wasn't there. And anyway, this guy is just scratching at the wall, trying to go towards <laughs> this woman and, and they, he couldn't get him out of the trance. Um, and, uh, and eventually, uh, you know, uh, uh, a little truck with white uh, guys in white clothes came and took him away. So uh, what? Yeah, yeah, this guy was messed up after that. So uh, wait, wait, but how long was he away? Did he was he away for months after that? No, he never came back. He what? Never. He never came back after that one. Uh, one he after that one time. Yeah, no, he went into whatever state of psychosis or whatever. He went. He was gone. Wow. And so that it, it turns out there was nothing in our rule book that says you can't hypnotize somebody. So you know they. <laughs> They waited and they threw a glass in the mess hall. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's 
that's really different right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, okay. Let's, um, uh, let's touch upon some other things about Trump. He, it says, um, a lot of people now presume that uh, Trump did, does shady business, that he's not law abiding, that he does this and that. So w- what's your um, having no, uh, been in no, 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 no. with Trump? It's nonsense. It's nonsense. Look, his character was pretty well in, intact, you know, when we were together when he was 17 years old. Yeah. And this is a decent, honest guy that, and in fact, let me, let me, let me explain this a little bit better. We, we had, we had an honor code that we all lived by. It was part of our fabric. Uh, you know, we, we, we wore a tie every day. Uh, now there were some days we were in dress uniform or a service uniform and they didn't have ties, but the daily dress that we went to classes in and so on, it was a tie to wear. And it always had to tie a Windsor knot, a double Windsor, just like this knot here. Yeah. It's a military knot. You will see that that's the only knot that Donald ever ties. Okay. I don't think he knows how to tie any other kind of knot. I don't. And the fact is that this is in him. It's in his blood. And the honor code was also in his blood. But even more important than that, the brutality I was talking about, the, you know, with me, and I tell a pretty interesting story of how I went through new guy rules. New guy rules are what you go through in your first year, no matter how old you are when you get there. And they're somewhat brutal. And, uh, and there's a lot of silly rules, uh, you know, like you, you have to slam yourself against the wall if somebody that's an old cadet, an older cadet, meaning not a new guy, walks by you and, and scream out, sorry to be in your way, sir, as you raise, bring yourself up to attention oh, wow. and do that and, and stand there. But it was also uh, brutal in, in, in other ways. And he was uh, with a fellow named uh, Ted Tobias. Major Tobias. Now, Major Tobias, before he was at New York Military Academy, he was, I believe he was in the, well, he was definitely in the Korean War. I don't know whether he was, had, <laughs> oh, I don't think he was uh, old enough to be in the, in the Second World War, but he was uh, older than us. And uh, believe me, he could have taken on the whoever. He was, he was a tough guy and you didn't mess with the mage. Well, imagine Donald Trump being this wise ass from Queens coming to New York Military Academy and coming to and being under the direct control and, and uh, command of uh, the mage who nobody messed with. OK, nobody. You, you if you didn't fear this guy it's because you're you're deaf, dumb and blind. Right. Uh, I mean, this this guy. And so this is what Donald was confronted with. And he learned very quickly that if you learn the rules and you abide by the rules, you're going to be all right. And in fact, you can excel. And that's what he learned to do then. I mean, this guy not only knows how to color between the lines, so to speak, but he can build skyscrapers between the lines. Right. Right. Donald Trump is one of the most amazing people in this way. And then I'll tell you how it pays off. You know, first of all, it pays off because he's never been in that kind of trouble. I mean, you'd think that if he were breaking the rules and breaking the laws, he would have been nailed with this, with all the, the businesses that he's been in. And businesses cause you to have enemies as well. Right. And I've heard from time to time where he didn't pay somebody that was a vendor of his. And every single time I looked into a little bit more, I knew exactly what happened, which was Somebody just did substandard work and didn't deserve to get paid. Somebody messed up a job and shouldn't have been paid. But the yeah. fact is that we he's been tested. He's been tested as much as a person can be tested because we had something called the Mueller investigation. Right. Okay. Remember the the supposed Russian right. the conspiracy, three, the Russia, complicity. Russia, Russia, Russia. Yeah collusion, Russian collusion. Well, they, they weren't, he had people, he had what, 19 lawyers or something like that. Every single one of them hated Donald Trump's guts because that's kind of part of being in that tribe right. is you have right. to hate this man. You don't know him. He never did anything to you, but you know, my God, he has children in cages, you know, what a heartless person. And I don't blame Obama for it because Obama probably didn't know personally what was going on. And, uh, but those kids were in cages and Obama's under Obama. Yeah. Nobody said, they're like, yeah, 
oh, it's Obama. Everything he does is golden. And then Trump comes in and then they start yapping about that. <laughs> right, right. Well, Obama was part of the system and Donald wasn't. But, you know, the fact is with the with those kids in cages, I don't blame Obama any more than I blame anybody. You know, they, they're running out of room. They needed to do something quick. And but the Supreme Court said no way. And Obama fixed it and changed it because he was required to because of that Supreme Court decision. Mm -hmm. And by the time Donald got there, there were no kids in cages. You know, Obama did the right thing by cleaning it up. But it certainly wasn't Donald keeping kids in cages. So, right. but anyway, for one reason or other, these people, these, these, these investigators, these lawyers, they hated Donald Trump. And then, and they, they had what, 30 million, $40 million that they could spend, that they did spend investigating yeah. him. Yeah. And then they all had staff and they had other investigators. They had whatever they needed. In other words, they had an unlimited budget to go into Donald Trump's life and find a crime. They believe me, they weren't looking for Russian collusion. They all knew that was a farce. And we know that for a fact now that right. they all and knew they, it was a farce. And they bugged um, uh, Trump as well. Before yeah. He was yeah. president. And they, they bugged him. They yeah. did everything to, to find anything that he did that was illegal. And as I say, you know, they, they weren't looking for Russian collusion. They were looking for anything. They were, if they could have found him spitting in the subway, they would have nailed him for it. Yeah. But he doesn't break the law. He's not the criminal that people think that he is. And so he doesn't even drink. He doesn't even drink. <laughs> he doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke marijuana or do any other drugs. He's a totally straight guy, you know. Yeah. But, you know, I'll tell you one thing about Donald, you know, talking about, you know, talking about that he doesn't drink. I think about being over at Mar-a-Lago where other people were drinking. I, I, I happen to not drink either, but uh, that's my choice. But uh, in any event, uh, he, I'm losing my own thought here. What, what I was well, so you went but to yeah, Mar-a-Lago? Oh yeah, yeah, I've been there many times. Yeah. And, and uh, that's that's where he it, stays now if i'm not mistaken he he's yeah. taking some time off and i mean he was he was criticized the worst uh, uh, more than george w bush he was criticized mercilessly since the day he got in they were protesting every day he got in they were protesting collusion collusion russia russia every day and then even when that um because uh, you know I, I told this story on a previous podcast but i was um uh, in israel for three months um, in hostels, you know, and I was there and I, w I went to the uh, Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem and I'm there watching the carnage that uh, that uh, Hitler brought upon his own people and the bombings and everything. The, anyway, there was a lot of dead people on the street and all, and we were looking at the scene and there's this American woman, a uh, black woman, must have been in her 40s and 50s. She looks at the scene and she's like, and mind you, this is before Trump got in. This is between like January 2017 when he was president-elect and he hadn't even done anything. And she goes, this makes me so sad because this reminds me of Trump. This is the kind of sickness that the people are programmed with. Like he hadn't even done anything and they're comparing him to Hitler. Like, uh, and you knew the man and uh, he... Do you think he was a bully? He sounds like he was actually an anti-bully, that he was saving people from being bullied. You know, it's, that, that's another good question. Um, was he a bully? Um, there were captains that were bullies, okay? Captains of some of the companies. And that's the way they ran their companies because they needed to get certain results. They needed to make sure that you passed inspection. Now, every day of the week, uh, except for Sunday, we had inspections of our rooms. On Saturdays, it was a stand-up white glove inspection. I mean, you stood at attention at the foot of your bed. Uh, your roommate stood at attention at the foot of his bed. The inspecting officer and the captain of the company would walk into your room and the inspecting officer would be wearing white gloves. And he takes those gloves and he goes over the casing around your door using those white gloves. He goes over your lockers, feeling over your lockers. If there's any dust on his gloves, you're in trouble, okay? Uh, so many of the 
captains would be a little bit brutal, you know, scaring people if you, you know, living in fear. And that's what I was talking about before. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around here. Okay. But I didn't finish my story about Ted Tobias and what, you know, the, 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 the fear that was in the works. Those captains I'm now talking about uh, and these cadets, younger, smaller people, you know, when I went there, for instance, I was, what, 140 pounds, 15 years old. Uh, and the oldest cadets were more like full grown men and, uh, and athletes that would basically uh, take you to task. It was a very scary thing for those boys and, and for me and for Donald too. It was, it was a scary thing until you finally learned to surmount it, until you learned to stand up to those people. That's what the, the whole exercise was all about. It's the military, it's boot camp. It's what every soldier has gone through. It's what every Marine goes through to build in the courage that they need to face the enemy. And that's why Donald Trump, unlike so many other presidents who promised to move the embassy, talking about Israel, yeah. to Jerusalem, uh, actually, he, he's the first one that didn't wimp out. He did it. Why? Because he's not, a, he's not a man that yields to those fears. Oh, somebody's not going to like it. Somebody's not going to like you. Oh, the Palestinians are never going to come to peace. They're never going to come to the peace table. No, he's going to do what he thinks is right. And that's and because he's fearless. Yeah. And I'm not saying, you know, and there's a difference between having courage, which sometimes could be even stupidity. But yeah. There's a difference between having courage and having a lack of that fear that paralyzes so many people, like the judges on the Supreme Court that he appointed that didn't have the guts to uh, to uh, hear his case uh, yeah. after the election. I was very sad that because um, I thought I thought there was shenanigans in in Michigan, uh, in Georgia, in Pennsylvania, uh, maybe even Arizona. Um, well, how could it possibly be anything else? I mean, if, if the state of Pennsylvania mails out 1.8 million mail-in ballots to be mailed back. How many do you expect to get back? 60%, maybe 80%? We, okay, so right. a million 500,000 of the million 800,000 should come back, right? Yep. Do you know how many came back? More. <laughs> Two and a half million came back. 700,000 more than they printed came and mailed out came back. They know these exact numbers. It's actually a little more than 700,000 that came back. And they're saying, uh, yeah, there's no evidence. Well, the truth be told, they never investigated because they didn't want to. Because if they had, they investigated, they would, the whole thing would have would have started to this, blow apart. This is all coming out. Michael Lindell, I really respect the man. I really like the guy for what he's doing. I, I think he's an American hero. Uh, he does a great job with his advertising campaigns, but unfortunately, for my pillow. But unfortunately, uh, the documentary that he prepared, you know. He shouldn't have been in it. He should have just backed it and right. had the right people that really knew how to make better presentations. Uh, I liked it and I thought that it was, uh, it, it, it gave certain information, but it really wasn't the kind of job that I think a good documentary uh, person would have been able to have done to really show it all. I mean, we know, but that, you know, that takes care of Pennsylvania all by itself, just just the number of mail-in ballots to say nothing of what happened with the Dominion machines. And there's so much proof of that. How many, how many have you seen, for instance, of videos of people who just had their TV screens that they videoed and you could see the numbers all of a sudden jump down and for yeah. Donald Trump. Yeah. And there's no yeah, way yeah. numbers go down when you're counting votes. There's no negative votes. Uh, it, it's only gets added up and higher and then one goes higher than the other. And yet the numbers would jump down 700 for Donald and jump up at the same instant for 700 for, for Biden or however, num whatever the numbers were. So, yeah, you know, we know that yeah. this is all fixed. There was in Pennsylvania, I think, uh, I think a batch of about more than 100,000 votes. And there was only like 2,000 of them were for Trump and the rest were Biden. Like, I mean, come on. I'm not. I'm not a ma mathematician, but that's uh, almost impossible statistically that you get that. Even in a very liberal city, you're not going to get that. Yeah, it's funny how we who looked into it and looked and saw facts or paid attention to the camera on the ceiling in Fulton County, Georgia, and watch what happened in terms of uh, them pulling these suitcases of ballots out. 
in every one of these states, we see all this fraud and uh, and how you know the country is now in a very frightening state because I mean let's let's go back let's go back uh, twelve years to uh, to a uh, a Bush cam uh, campaign and let's just say that uh, that uh, Al Gore and George Bush were at odds and there was a challenge, but let's just say Al Gore said, look, there was fraud in this campaign and people around him said that there was fraud in their campaign. What harm would that have done to allow the public to say or people to say and surmise and give conspiracy theories or whatever that there was fraud in the election? So why is it now so impossible or so, so much so that you have to be erased in the event that you should make such a suggestion. Yeah. I mean, why is it that our world has turned into this? You know, it's, I mean- It's almost fascism what they're doing because they, it's a collusion of um, politics, of uh, big business, uh, academia, um, the, the deep state, everybody's in, in collusion together because they have all, they're all uh, what uh, Eric Coffer called uh, true believers in the very far left woke liberal cause, you know? So Trump bad, orange man bad, and uh, you know Biden must be good. Therefore, you know it's just it's it's uh, it's almost like 1984 we're starting to live in. It's a very scary world. It is 1984 we're starting to live in. It's the beginning of it. It's the beginning of a nightmare, um, and it is a scary world. I'm, look, there's two impossible possibilities. Okay, two, and when I say impossible, I don't really mean impossible like they that, that they can't exist but it's just impossible to believe, okay? One impossible situation that I, I find I cannot believe is that we have someone who rigged the election in power or the China rigged the election in power and we've got a puppet for China that's in power. We know that Biden had connections with China that were unseemly uh, through Hunter and so on with that whole bunch of shenanigans that was going on. And we know that every appointee uh, that Biden is suggesting for his cabinet or any other position has to be somebody that highly favors China. Right. So there's something going on here with China that you know makes it. And we know from we know from uh, John Radcliffe's report uh, as director of uh, national intelligence in in compliance with the September 12, 2018 order that declared an emergency by Donald Trump in terms of foreign intervention with our elections. Right. Uh, we know, and that was renewed in 2019 and renewed in 2020. So that order is now still in effect, which declares an emergency in the United States. And we know from that report that uh, China, Iran, and Russia interfered with our election process. So if this occurred and we have uh, we we also have other people like Michael Flynn and other people indicating that these things have been done according to Hoyle yeah. the way they're supposed to be done. Then uh, then we have this scenario that this 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 is all in the works. But if that happened and there was that inter interaction, then we are living in a totalitarian state. There won't be any more elections in the future that are going to be real or fair. So because wait, if you, these people who are out of office can rig the election and then they get into office, who in office is going to make sure that this gets investigated properly? These, these investigations will never occur. So they can do it election after election after election as we go forward, assuming that what we see as the reality of the moment, which is that Biden is our president and Kamala Harris is our vice president, and all the people that are elected are duly elected and in office and like it or not, this is what we've got. Well, if that's the reality, which seems to be the reality, then we're into a, a new age. We're into a world order where, the, where it's not America first anymore. It's the world first and America last. Right. And it's a very frightening scenario. In, it's a, it's a lot worse than Obama's uh, presidency. Like uh, Obama was at least a uh, smart. Biden isn't even smart. <laughs> you know, he, 
Yeah, but he's got other people's brains, OPB. Don't don't count on that. I knew that everything would start happening pretty quickly. And look how efficient he's been in terms of getting his orders done. But then again, we now know that Bill Barr was in place to give him everything he wanted while Bill Barr was still the attorney general. Really? He, yeah, yeah, because these executive orders were actually being cleared by the Justice Department in advance. Is That's why Bill Barr didn't want to investigate anything, because Bill Barr wouldn't do anything. I wonder why... No. Uh, Bill Barr is a traitor to the American way. I he, wonder Bill Barr is a scoundrel. And I think he's profited highly from this from what I've heard. You know, you know what uh, you know what I think were, were the mistakes Trump made, uh, in my opinion. I think uh, Mike Pence, uh, looking back, uh, he was not the, the strong man that he needed. He was just an establishment guy. He needed somebody to really, uh, maybe a Rudy Giuliani or some somebody like that. He needed somebody who'd been in the military who had guts or somebody who right. went to New York Military Academy. He needed somebody that at some point learned not to be afraid and not to be fearful because that's what really happened to Pence. No guts. Right. You know, it's unfortunate. A weakling of a man who should never be in any position of power. And also the the judges that he appointed were not were they were good judges compared to the liberal ones, but they were not like uh, Clarence Thomas. So well, he had the Thomas votes. Though, were the two that yeah. said that they should have looked at the case, uh, but these three uh, we, they they did not. They betrayed you him. Know what? Let, but let's be fair. These are civilians. You know, in the military, these are what we call civilians, mm -hmm. and civilians are not combatants. And, you know, you let the civilians know that should they stand up and do this for Donald Trump, then their children, their children's lives may be in jeopardy, uh, that uh, people know where they live uh, and that, uh, that they're going to need to be under the protection of people for the rest of their lives. They wimped out. And uh, that's more understandable. But what I was saying in terms of the executive order that declared the emergency on September 12, 2018, uh, that was a different situation because now if everything is in the hands of the military, now the real question is, did the military wimp out the way those judges did? Because if they didn't wimp out, there are a number of people and, uh, and uh, not, not even to get into my own thoughts and my own beliefs, let me just talk of the fact that if you go on the internet and you start looking, you'll find that there are many, many, there are millions of people that believe that the military is in control right now. And there are all kinds of little anomalies that, that people can find that could mean one thing or the other, but, you know, and they ask questions like, well, why isn't Trump telling us it's all over if it's all over? Why is he being quiet? We understand he'd be quiet if the military was in control, but why is he quiet if Biden's in control? Why doesn't he can just admit that it's all over and Biden is our president. He has to know that these things are going on. These things are being said. And yet he tells, tells us that like this very last tweet, he indicated that uh, he used three different expressions in that particular tweet to say that, don't worry, uh, you're not gonna get pushed around. You know, the people that believed America first, that, uh, Make America and and subscribe to Make America Great Again. We'll hear a giant voice now. America First, Make America Great Again, and Giant Voice were all in capital letters in that tweet. So what does he mean? We're going to all hear a giant voice for a long time. He said. So what 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 does that mean? Who talks like that? Who says you're going to hear a giant voice? Well, giant voice just happens to be the name of something, the same as the concept of America first is the name of something, the same as make America great again is the name of something. And these were the three things that were all in caps. Giant voice is the name of the military emergency broadcast system. Oh, wow. That, that's, the, that's what that's called. You can look it up in Google, you'll see what, what it is, giant voice. So why is Donald Trump telling us we're going to hear a giant voice? I mean, usually one thing about Donald is he says what he means and means what he says, especially in those tweets, like them or not, whether you agree with them or not, he at least means what he says. So 
there's uh, there's that other reality that's also impossible that right. the military is in charge right now. But you that's say, unbelievable as well. I don't know. Uh, I guess I can't see it if the military is in charge right now. But do you think it's still possible that that executive order will come into effect at some point and then the military will take over? It is in effect. Oh, and I, my understanding is that he gave those things to the military, you know, gave his proofs. And the military had to do its investigation to determine whether or not the election really was stolen because the military is sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States and to protect it. And to have a foreign country, a foreign power like China, come into the United States, whether it's through uh, the uh, computer hookup to our voting machines with Dominion, or whether they were the ones that counterfeited that million votes that got dumped in Pennsylvania, whatever it was, the fact of the matter is, is that's a foreign country taking over our country. Right. And, right. and I'm just hoping that the people in charge of the military, unlike the civilians who wimped out, have what it takes to make sure that uh, they save this country from any such intrusion, because that's the only other possibility. That's, that's the thing that people are holding on to. That's, that's, we have millions, many millions of Americans that may not believe it, but are hoping for it. So do you and, think the military is still investigating right now? Maybe they haven't concluded yet because uh, maybe well, there would be something because the maybe the media is covering everything this, like this up. I think that by now it would be a conclusion would be made. Military tribunals work very rapidly and thoroughly and well. They're much more efficient than in our civil system because if arrests are ever made, it will be through military tribunals that will be trying them a after uh, John Wilkes Booth killed uh, Abraham Lincoln. His uh, conspirators were not tried by uh, juries of the peers. They were tried by military tribunals. Right. Uh, if this happened, this country would be in a state of martial law eventually. But uh, you know, now the latest theory is that it's going to wait until after the impeachment hearings are, are done and, uh, and uh, Donald's out of the woods on that. But, uh, but, but that's he, just shameful he, what they're doing with the impeachment trial. He's out of office, should be unconstitutional. You can't impeach somebody who's not even in office, right? Well, there's already been a decision by, by Chief Judge uh, Justice Roberts because he refused to sit in, in that impeachment hearing because there is no president. He, he only, the Chief Judge Justice of the United States under the Constitution, it's not a rule made up by Congress or anybody. It, it's the Constitution of the United States requires the Chief Justice to, to uh, lead this investigation in the Senate. You know, oh, to, so it's not legal anyway, in a way. Oh, no, it's not legal at all. Oh. Uh, but, okay, so you got the Chief Judge Justice who said, no, he's out of office. He's no longer the president. So therefore, I'm not going to sit. And so doesn't that determine the issue? Didn't uh, the Chief Justice decide that the president's not the president anymore, so he can't, uh, he, you know, that he's not going to deliberate there, because the Constitution says, in terms of impeaching the president, the chief justice is the one that has to sit. So instead, they get Lee, you know, they get one of the most partisan people that you can have. He's the fair judge that's wow. going to sit over this Congress, over the Senate. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's it's all a farce, and I've seen things that make. It looked like a tremendous farce, and even including the, the girl that was supposedly uh, murdered, uh, shot in the neck or shot in the belly, different stories say different things. No follow-up. We, we didn't see her funeral. They're not releasing the name of the police officer that supposedly shot him. And I've seen things on the internet that explain and show that this whole thing was really a, a, like a film production. And some of it is, you know, you see these members of a SWAT team there, and they're they're picking up their rifles and aiming them all of a sudden down an empty hallway. And you know, the hallway's empty because they the camera's already been there. And uh, <laughs> and you, 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 you and then they put them down again and they're just gaffing around and they pick them up. And, you know, it's, the whole thing is just, uh, it, 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 I, I just hope that all of this comes out. It, usually these things will. And the people who think that they could be silenced by taking them off of Facebook and YouTube and so on, uh, you know what? You had a, you know, it's like having some bank robbers, some small time bank robbers 
crafty in their trade. They, 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 they think they're robbing a bank, but by mistake, they're in Fort Knox. And now they're stealing <laughs> all the gold out of Fort Knox. You know, right. it's, it's more than they could possibly handle. There's too many people involved. It's not the kind of crime that you can keep secret. Now, right. It's, can... it's everything. Like, uh, I think if this comes out and, and these people are proven to be uh, frauds and, and that they stole the entire election, but what if it, this does like the, the scary thing is what if what if they get away with with all this shenanigans like I think this is this is almost like um, the breaking point of America like the uh, point of no return. Of no, if, if this happens, if this if this happens the way many of us think that it has happened, well, you know what? It's time to go, maybe uh, just. Find a good business that you can do well in, and, uh, and and forget politics. Because I'm telling you, there's nothing. I mean, imagine what can you do? Start a militia, and do what? Shoot an innocent no. police officer? Shoot no. an innocent soldier? No. Sh- e- even if somebody were to to to, to conspire it, to do something like that to the president, uh, you know, to Biden or Harris or whatever, another person's going to pop into their place. There's no changing things by by by. Th- th- we're done. This country is over if this yeah. is the case. And and I'm saying if this is the case, because nobody really knows exactly whether it is or not. But if it is, uh, then it is just as you suggested, suggested the beginning of 1984. Right. You know, at this point, you know, we're losing our voice. If we lose our voice, I mean, look, you know, Lou Dobbs just is off the air now. And it just may be Let's- one person, but it's one after another after another. Uh, the voices of conservatism is are disappearing, right? And instead, we're only hearing one voice. Well, if I if you only hear one voice, if you only have one flavor ice cream, that's vanilla. Nobody's thinking about chocolate anymore. Okay, so it's not just losing your voice; it's losing your thoughts. Yes. And this is freedom of thought that is disappearing from this country, the United States of America. It's so inconceivable to me. This country that. I owe so much to that I love so much is now changing so quickly and so harshly and negatively. Yeah. So, and and yeah. and Peter, this is just all across all across the board of the Western world. Because I went back, I'm now back in university and I'm, I'm even though I'm Slovenia, because of COVID, I'm um in university in Scotland. Uh, and um it's very one-sided. Like all the political stuff they present. They, they just present one point of view, the left or the far left, intersectionality, um, critical race theory, things like that, things that, that started in the late 60s and then became, became progressively worse and, and, and invaded and pervaded now academia. Um, for it's the all worst. China. It's all China. China owns the major industries in Italy, for instance. They, who owns Fiat? Who owns Ferrara, Ferrari? Who owns Ma, uh, Maserati? Who owns all these companies now? It's China. Uh, who controls Italy is China. Who controls much of Europe is China. Who is now controlling the United States appears to be China as well. So, you know, we're going to see how this plays out in the years ahead. And we're going to see the charade. We're going to see, you know, now Joe Biden is saying, uh, you know, we have to take a hard stance with China. but watch watch what happens rather than what anybody says and it's like you know me, me, I, meanwhile you know you know we can only hope not not that we don't have a dictator but we can hope for benevolence but yeah. i'll tell you that's what worries me the most and that's where i think that they're making a big mistake which is their vehemence their uh their 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 total anger and uh you know, it doesn't matter whether it does good for the United States or not. If it's Trump, it needs to be undone. If he built a, a wall or, you know, maybe they're not taking down the wall yet. But if he didn't want borders to be uh, crossed, let people cross the borders. Whatever it is that he stood for, they stand against. And right. they do it, as I said, with this vehemence and this hatred for Trump supporters uh, but Trump supporters are the, are their subjects. We are the citizens of this country, and we're the people who they should be caring about and helping, not people they should be hating and finding ways of getting retribution is against. I mean, you know, what's going on now is 
you know, people, anybody's a Trump supporter, they should be banned from working in certain con companies. They should be, uh, you know, that, that we're treated as though we are domestic uh, terrorists when terrorism or violence is the furthest thing from what any of these people would ever bring to the table. They, right. they, they're anything but. Yeah. They're like, you need the re-education because you are a Republican, basically. That's, yeah, that's I know. <laughs> my kids need to be, uh, you know, re-educated. I told my daughter this and she's 42 years of old age and she, she wasn't happy about the fact she may be having to go and be re-educated with other people's children. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, obviously I'm kidding here, but the people that are saying these things aren't kidding. Yeah, and, they, they say it right on TV, right on MSNBC. There's guests saying, you know, I think we should put uh, these Trump supporters. By the way, there's 75 million, 74, 75 million people in the United States that voted for Trump. No, I think it's close to 79 million, or over 79 million, if you really count properly. It, it okay. Take away the votes that were switched and one. Uh, right. and, I, I understand it's more like it, it's over 79 million, not quite 80. But there's a lot of people that would have to like uh, put in. I mean, this is just absurd to talk about re-education camps. Like, where where has the old liberal, like uh, JFK liberal, gone? Like, oh, long have the days gone of those liberals, well, and now well, it's hey, just most like liberals are, most liberals is, are as good people as most conservatives. And you know, it, it depends on you know. It's really the leadership. The, the, the number of people that actually are causing this are a very small little thin line uh, of people in comparison to the masses of the country. And as much as some, you know, somebody, you know, maybe your sister, maybe other people, people that disagree with you may have strong, strong feelings or may even hate Donald Trump. I gotta tell you, you know, if, if the truth could start getting uh, told in the press for a change, if, if people could just understand reality rather than the uh, what the media wants us to believe, then I think, uh, you know, that, that it would dissipate. Right. It's not that it's not like everybody's a leader in that cause or in the conservative cause. And Even, the way it looks now, it looks like it's going to be the conservatives that are going to dissipate. Because if you take away the leadership in the conservative party or the conservative, the Republican party, and take away the, the the leadership in society that brings people to that. It's like I said, if there's only vanilla ice cream that's available, people stop thinking about the other flavors. Yeah, this is uh, highly disturbing. I think this, if this uh, goes unchallenged, it'll be uh, it'll be the end of America. But uh, my hope is that um, I have a lot of guests on that uh, we talk about metaphysical and spiritual things. And some of them tell me that um, there's there is gonna be a great change between now and, and 2025. So hopefully there'll be change for the better, not for the worse, because change can mean either up or down. It, you know. Well, it could happen. It could happen. But let me just remind the audience and the people watching this podcast to go to Amazon and look for Tickton, T-I-C-K-T-I-N, or just what makes Trump tick. Right. And uh, get a copy of my book, please. It's, uh, I know you'll enjoy it. Thank you. Let, let's end on a positive note. Sorry? What's that? I am sorry. I had to throw a commercial in. <laughs> there you go. It's like, uh, it's like the movie. Um, you know that movie with Jim Carrey, The Truman Show, where, where, where his yeah, yeah, wife yeah. will all of a sudden start with a commercial and say, hey, buy this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he'd be like, and Jim Carrey would be like, who are you talking to? <laughs> All right. Um, so do you have any, um, first, uh, what do you think uh, Trump is going to do next? It, I don't know which reality we're living in. Hmm. Uh, the one we're seeing or the one that may come about. Uh, I'm just hoping to God that they don't prosecute him. Okay. Uh, you know, it's not as though he can win a trial in Washington, D.C. Mm. And there's serious charges that they could bring, inciting a riot that led to deaths. But he didn't. He, he No, he didn't. No, it doesn't matter if he's guilty or innocent. Roger Stone was innocent. He got tried in Washington, D.C. It didn't help. I mean, he got convicted. <clears throat> it doesn't matter if you're innocent. These people have a vengeance. They, especially the you know, I mean, there's only 15,000 registered Republicans in Washington, D.C. <laughs> you know, it, it's, 
it's not exactly a, a place where you can get a fair trial by your peers. Hmm. Do you have any cause for optimism, anything optimistic to end on the podcast? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, nobody's ever going to hear. <laughs> no, no, no. But I'm saying, I'm saying this is, uh, this is real stuff that we're talking about. Like it might, it might end badly. So I think it's important that people learn the truth. Well, the truth is that it's possible that the military is in place and waiting until this impeachment thing is over or waiting for something else. Uh, I don't know what to hope for or what, what to suggest. I don't want to give people false hope, but I'll tell you, false hope is better than desperation. And I know there are some people that are as bad as suicidal in terms of the way they're looking at this. And, you know, it's, I, I do think that most people deep down in their souls are basically good people. I don't think that uh, President Biden, uh, you know, assuming that he is actually the president of the United States, and he certainly seems to be, but I don't think he's a person that uh, is full of evil intent of, ha, ha, now I get to do some evil destruction. I'm going to destroy these people or destroy those. I don't think that that's his agenda. And, uh, and, and all I can, we can hope for is that, uh, that the way of life from day to day is better under this regime. But remember, right now we're under this regime. And we have uh, not only face masks that are going to be coming mandatory, even for the states where they don't think it should be uh, for travel and so on. Uh, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's not a good thing. It's not for me to judge. But these these uh, these ideas where they want control over people uh, is uh, is is worrisome. So my, but my optimism is we can always hope for the best just because I'm describing uh, the worst doesn't mean that the best isn't as real and as possible uh, a possibility. Right. So uh, anyway, I think that's the best place to leave it. That is, <laughs> that is the hope of the day. Yeah. The, the power of positive thinking. I think Trump was really... Um, Donald was really inspired by, uh, who was that preacher? Uh, Norman Vincent Peale, Power of Positive Thinking. I think that really influenced him too. And he had a saying uh, when he was campaigning, the best is yet to come. And I really hope for America and the world, the West, the whole Western world that's uh, in trouble now. That um, But we have heard, we have heard from Donald Trump Jr. We've heard the same thing from Donald Trump, you know, that the best is yet to come. And so if these promises are based in reality, which, as I say, Donald Trump doesn't just say things, he says things because he believes them to be real and true. So if that's the case, if, if Donald Trump has made it clear that the best is yet to come and that we will be hearing that voice and so on and so forth, I, I think that there's reason to be hopeful. I, right. I, I certainly have hope. You don't see me sitting in a corner whining away. I'm here, I'm working hard. Uh, as a trial lawyer, and, right. uh, what I do, and I'm um, helping the cause the best I can because, because uh, I want to give back to America. I can't do it on the level that Donald Trump did because that man's put him, not just his money on the line, he's put his freedom on the line. He's put everything on the line. Not just his freedom, his children's freedom. Everything, Think about it. Everything. Everything. Yeah. Do, do you still are you still in contact uh, contact with uh, with Donald at times? I I wrote uh, an email to him recently, and I, I and and then I got one back saying that you know please invoke the insurrection act, and I uh, I got an email back, uh, and as I was moving the cursor to open that email, clip it disappeared. What? Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you using have, Gmail? Might have, they, they might have pulled it back. You know, I don't know. All I know it was there one second and not there the next. Oh, they so, might have unsend it or something. But that's possible. Yeah, but uh, that's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, look, I tell you something. I know Donald Trump. I I know him to be the fine, uh, the, one of the finest, maybe the finest man I I've ever known. I mean, he's. Uh, I, I'm the leader of this law firm. It's the Tickton Law Group. And uh, I would have a hard time working for anybody else or taking instructions from anybody else. But if Donald Trump were to say jump, I would say from what floor? 
and right. do it. Right. Yeah. He was not a. I, I think that the, uh, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to mention this. A lot. The the biggest accusation that people made against him, and I wanted to clarify, was they were saying he's a liar and all that. And uh, yeah. but you're saying this is definitely not your experience at all. Oh no, no. And all the things they say he lies about are not things that he's lying about. They accuse him of lying right away, and then they find out the truth later. And I will say there have been a few times where he said something like, only I can be, you know, fix what's broken. And, uh, you know, and I remember cringing when, I, when he said that when he was running for president the first time. And, and I thought, oh, don't say that, Donald. And then within about three days or four days, I realized, you know what? He's right. He is. You know, like, <laughs> so, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, is no, he's, he doesn't lie. He doesn't need to. He doesn't think that way. I know how he thinks because we have the same teachers, the same system, the same everything, same uniforms, same, same military training, same everything. Right. And I understand right. his thinking because of that. And, and he's you're, not a liar. And you're very successful now. I, I, before we start, before we started the podcast, I was saying you have a, because this is a in the COVID times, you're doing your business from Zoom, so uh, or, right. so this is you have a perfect lighting, perfect background nice chair everything the suit on you know some some lawyers come up with, without a suit so and you have the perfect suit on you have everything going <laughs> well i have to appear in court this way and the yeah. fact of the matter is is the rest of the, of the lawyers haven't caught on to the fact that there's only one made, way to make the, you only get one first impression and even if they know the judge already uh it shows respect it shows authority mm. and you know if i want to have my authoritativeness accepted and I want to be believed in terms of my theories and my, my, the evidence I present and so on. Uh, I figured let's do this thing properly. So yes, I have theatrical lighting. I've got, uh, you know, uh, something behind me that can, does not cause any distraction when I speak. And it also, to some extent, maybe it'd be better if it were a little more black, but it matches the border of the, of the zoom, uh, right. uh, uh framing. So, you know, basically, uh, you know, if you're going to do things, you might as well do them right. There we go. And th that's how uh, I imagine a lot of people from that school, especially in your year, were very successful when it went on. Like Trump, obviously the most successful, but. Yeah, well, you know, the difference between a million and a billion is this. If I were to take thousand dollar bills and put one dollar bill, one thousand dollars on top of another and make a pile pile would end up being about eight and a half inches tall. Right. To make a million dollars of thousand dollar bills. Hmm. If I keep adding to that pile, throwing another one, another one, another one, until I get to a billion, the pile will be far taller than the Washington Monument. Wow. That's the difference between a million and a millionaire and a billion and a billionaire. Okay. This man is a billionaire. I'm not smart enough to be a billionaire. He is. Right. Okay. Right. Let's put it that way. All right. Well, here he is. Peter Tickton, everybody. Uh, can you show the book one on one time? So we, and on, yes. on that, there we go. So what makes what? Trump tick? Yes. And you can get Absolutely. it on Amazon. I'll, I'll put the link in the description as well. So people on YouTube can, if they want to buy it, they can get it. Um, thank you. Appreciate th it. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And um, thank you. Really nice meeting you. Nice to meet you as well. And everybody, thank you for watching or listening.